Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is Phil. This is the Phil Fisher Podcast. I am here with Christian Taylor. Hey, Phil. Hi, Christian. How are you? I'm good. I'm feeling a little lonely up here. I know. There's an empty chair there is. next to you. We'll just have to pretend. Where Sky is supposed to be. Sky is flying back from Thailand today. We miss you, Sky. Yeah, how could you? So I'll sing the song and we'll have to sub out Sky for some something else. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky. Not. No, we won't. <laughs> and Christian, too. Hi, Phil. Yeah, because she's here. And we've got a guest here just for you. His name is Bill. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. Okay, um, we have a guest. His name is Bill. Uh, Bill, we thought I thought it was dire direness, direness, but it's you were wrong. It's dern dernness. It it is dern, except in Norwegian. Except it's, in Norwegian, it's, it's dur, 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 dernness. dernness, which means apparently a pub for a beer for a deer. No, it does a pub for a deer. <laughs> A watering hole. A watering hole for, for a, deer. a deer. Or That's expensive lovely. and precious. Yeah, a precious pub for a deer. Okay, uh, not a lot of news. I don't want to get into... Oh, there is a well, lot of so news. There's so much news. There's but... so much news that you just were overwhelmed <laughs> yeah, and couldn't decide. And, and we've had a few people say, hey, give us your point of view on everything that's going on. And I feel like we need to find the right guest to get into much of that. What? what? You think that we don't really have very good thoughts or opinions? There's crazy stuff going on. Well, I know, just, but... Just watch the opening to last weekend's Saturday Night Live to know how crazy... If you have to get that insane to, to parody it, you know it's crazy. Well, that's a very good point. But the point is that people yeah. love to hear your thoughts and Sky's thoughts uh, about all that yeah, craziness. Well, Sky's not here, so we'll have to so wait. So you're taking a pass. We'll if you're taking wait. the easy way out. We'll have to wait till next time. <laughs> yeah, here's, here's a question for you, though. This is interesting. And it's kind of political. Why are Christians so disproportionately powerful in Congress? You think they are? Is that a fact? Is that an alternative fact? Or really? Yeah, is that a, <laughs> awesome? That was great. 91% of the members of Congress identify as Christians. This proportion has basically remained constant for more than five decades, as long as this kind of data has been available, according to Pew Research. What has changed is the U.S. population. Only 71% of Americans identify as Christian. So 71% of Americans, 91% of congressmen. That is very interesting. Isn't that interesting? Uh, the Americans who are vastly underrepresented in Congress are those who don't identify with any religion at all. Only one member of Congress, Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, says she's religiously unaffiliated. Wow. As opposed to 25% of Americans that say they're religiously... That's interesting. There are... Do you want to know why? I would love to know why. There are at least two good explanations for this phenomenon. All right, lay them on me. The first is that religiously unaffiliated Americans don't vote. Have no soul. <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't vote. Um, why would they not vote? Another way of putting it is that young people don't vote. According to the Public, Research, Public Religion Research Institute, 18 to 29-year-olds are three times as likely to be religiously unaffiliated compared to people over 65. Uh, even though their share of the population has increased significantly from 14% to 22% between 2004 and 2010, or 2014, the share of religiously unaffiliated voters only increased from 9 to 12%. Hmm. So if you lose your religion, you also lose your will to vote. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Apparently. I think it's uh, honestly. I just like. I, of course, I have a 26 year old and a 20 year old, and it's a lot more complicated than that. You know, they're moving yeah. all over the place. They yeah. don't really have a set place. They're not really very politically well, involved. They, and do they have a, a sense of civic attachment? Are they likely to become uh, members of Rotary 
or the no. El- Elks Lodge. No, no, no. Or well, or Gideon's. I also think there is a despondency, which you know, is, is nobody really listens to us anyway. And what does my vote really count for? Yeah. And, yeah, and you think that's stronger among uh, our kids than? I, I think it has been. I think this election is probably changing things, as evidenced by Bernie Sanders following. Yeah. Um, Bill, where do you live? I'm coming from Altadena, California, just outside of Pasadena. Altadena. <laughs> How about you? Where are you guys? We are in uh, Wheaton, Illinois, the oh, e- wow. evangelical heartland. That's where I grew up. <laughs> what? Yeah. In, in Wheaton? I, I grew up on Webster Street in Wheaton, Illinois. That's right, next to Howard Street. Wow. And you wandered all the way out to Altadena? Yeah, well... Uh, it happens, and you're okay. Who is who is Bill Durness? You ask. Uh, William Durness. Do you have a you have a doctor of theology from the universe uh, University of Strasbourg? Is that true? Mm-hmm. That's right. How did you end up at Strasbourg? Well, I wanted to study theology and culture, and theology and the arts and things, and so I wanted to go to to France because that's where I figured that would be a place I could do that. And uh, nobody, there there was really not very many options for that kind of thing in those days. So there there was somebody from, it was a neighbor of of mine, actually, John Warwick Montgomery, maybe you know that name. He he lived in Wheaton and taught taught at uh, Trinity. Okay. He went there for his doctorate, so that, that's that I knew about that. So, oh, he so was there was a church. there was a two man parade to Strasbourg. Yeah, exactly. And so, what years were that? You said uh, way back then there weren't a lot of choices. When, when was way back then? We went. We went to to Strasbourg in 1968. Wow! 1968. I you, tell my students now, you don't know how lucky you are. You have all these options everywhere. I mean, back in those days. As an evangelical, your options were really very, very few, minimal. So, yeah, that, that's where I ended up. And uh, Bill is professor of theology and culture at Fuller Theological Seminary. He's the author of many books. That's not that's not me talking. That's the publisher talking. Okay. So if the publisher says it's many books, it's got to be true. It's got to be probably hundreds, uh, including modern art and the life of a culture. That's interesting. Senses of the Soul, Art and the Visual in Christian Worship, Reform Theology and Visual Culture, Changing the Mind of Missions, Theology Without Borders, and he was also the general editor of the Global Dictionary of Theology. Oh my goodness, when do you have time to do all this? (laughs) Do you have a life? You just live a long time, that's all. (laughs) (laughs) You just keep writing, and eventually you have an extensive library. Why uh, why the interest in art and visuals and not just... Because we're people of the book. It's just about words that have been printed on on paper, right? Yeah, right. Well, we have eyes, and we look at things, and we love what we look at. And all my life, I've loved art, and I've loved going to museums and things like that. But... um, and especially because when I was in college, I took my trips to Europe and I just was amazed at all the visual art and all. And I don't think I ever went to my parents in Wheaton never took me to the Art Institute or anything. Yeah. But I really was captivated by it. And so, you know, I started reading Francis Schaeffer and H.R. Uh, Ruckmacher, who I eventually went to study with. And so that's that was what sparked my interest. Yeah. Hmm. H.R. Ruckmacher. I don't know him, but I do know I'm, Francis Schaefer. I'm familiar with Schaefer, not as much with Ruckmacher. Is Ruckmacher someone we should know? Somebody? Is is he somebody what? Is he someone that we should know? Is he someone that we should no, be not reading? not necessarily. No, okay. he was just a close friend of Francis Schaefer, and he wrote on modern art. His book, Modern Art and the Death of a Culture, was a bestseller, and it's still in print, actually. That okay. sounds interesting. So wait a minute. So he wrote Modern Art and the Death of a Culture, and then you wrote Modern Art and the Life of a Culture. I'm thinking there's some sort of dialectical going on there. Were you exactly. responding? It's a dialogue. So yeah, what, our book is meant to be a kind of response to that. So what was he first, what was he saying, and then what were you saying in response? Well, he was saying that if you look at what's happening in modern art, it reflects the sort of death of Christian values, death of even what it means to be human, 
And he sees certain steps from that that start at the, in the Enlightenment and in, in Impressionism, and eventually led to the kind of uh, meaninglessness that's reflected in a lot of contemporary art. Okay. At the time, this was Dada and uh, Picasso and uh, Jackson Pollock. They were doing all these crazy things. Yep. And he felt like this reflected a kind of loss of values and uh, Christian orientation. And yep. so he wrote Modern Art and the Death of a Culture. It actually, it was a bestseller, uh, especially in England and, mm. uh, and the U.S. And as I say, it's been in print ever since. It's still in print. Would that would that sort of tie into the mood around um, you know Schaefer's uh, when he wrote with was it with Coop slouching towards Gomorrah? Exactly. Yeah, you're right. It 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 reflected a kind of declinist narrative post World War II and and the civil rights Vietnam all that was yep. going on during yep. that during that decade. His book came out in 1971, okay. and uh, it just reflected pretty much the way people were feeling about culture, the sexual revolution, uh, Vietnam, violence in the streets, yep. uh, that sort of thing. W women wearing slacks. Oh, all kinds of terrible things like that. <laughs> okay, so then you come <laughs> along. Swimming pools, you know. You come along and say, ooh, ooh, I have something to say about this. I'm going to write modern art and the life of a culture. What, what what did you have to say about it? Well, my co-author, uh, Jonathan Anderson, who teaches at Biola University. Okay. And I felt like in, in the development of modern art, first of all, there were a lot of theological issues that, was, that were at stake. Even if you think about the absence of God, still that's a theological issue. What happens, you know, yeah. when God is missing? How do we understand life? Where do we find meaning and so forth? So theological issues are at stake, even if people necessarily don't necessarily proclaim their religious right. faith. Even if, even if their art is a submerged crucifix in a jar of urine, it's still, there's theology at stake. Exactly. Well, that's a good example of how religious symbols and religious impulses are still vital in culture. If if a, if a crucifix didn't mean anything, he couldn't have used that to, to good effect. Right. That's a good point. Right, exactly. It, it wouldn't have a, a caused the sort of outrage that it did. So these symbols still carry sort of a lot of memory and weight for a lot of people, and so they can be used, even if they're used ironically. But we wanted to argue something more than that, and that is that we argue that at critical moments in the development of modern art, religious traditions functioned as sort of resources for developing those, those critical moments. Uh, Gauguin and Van Gogh, some of the two most important artists that actually lived together for a time in France, both come out of very strong religious traditions, and those religious traditions still function, even if their own uh, relationship to those traditions is it, it, it was uh, fraught and difficult. Yeah. So they still function. They still do things for people and for artists. Okay. Have you? Ha, do you guys? Do you guys look at uh, modern comic book culture and graphic novel culture, and then and would you fit that into modern art, or is that a, a whole separate narrative field? Well, that reflects what's going on in, in what you say popular culture. So yeah, that sort of thing is a reflection of the, 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 visual, the visual imagination at work and why it's important for evangelicals to begin to develop a visual literacy because those things are going on. I mean, we're, we're inundated with images yeah. uh, all the time in, in the course of our day and uh, comic books and, and uh, visual graphic novels is a big, big, uh, big genre. A growing genre, but not only for young people, but for all people. Right. Are you a, are you a movie fan? And movies, exactly. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, we just went to see Silence and uh, yep. interviewed Martin Scorsese here at Fuller. So oh, we're fun. interested wow. in all of that. Yeah. Okay. So do you see? This, this isn't even what we were supposed to be talking about because it's not your newest book. 
<laughs> we'll get to your newest book. Um, <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> do you? How do you see? And this is actually a theme in your book, at least early on, to to set the stage in the change in Christianity brought on by the Reformation and the Enlightenment. You know, from right. something that encompassed your whole life and how you live and how you do government and how you do everything to something that was much more about the head and the heart and, and less um, community, more individual, and more about, you know, reading and thinking and believing certain things as opposed to doing life. Is that a fair summation? Well, I, that's certainly what happened to the Protestant tradition. I don't think that's what the Protestant reformers intended when, yeah. when the Protestant Reformation took place, but you're right, that's what happened. To it, and I think that has to do also with the Enlightenment and 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 what happened in, in developments in Europe after that. But the Reformation certainly contributed to that. You're right. And how did that affect? How did you see that playing out in the world of visual representations, uh, you know, of the gospel and art and the church's interaction with senses other than mind? Well, I mean, that's a that's a, a, a very difficult and fraught topic because the, the simple answer is that the visual is replaced by the word, as you said earlier, we're people of the word, we're people of the book. But in fact, uh, uh, what happened at the Reformation was a very new kind of art was introduced, what we call congregational singing. Well, that has oh. had an enormous impact on the development of art and music, and you think of J.S. Bach and, and uh, the, the Handel and the Protestant oratorios. Okay. So that um, while certain things were were sort of left aside, altar pieces, uh, icons, and so forth, other forms of art came to take their place. And I think, and I'm I'm working on this right now. I think that one of the things that happened was that Calvin wanted to say that rather than have a, a worship experience that draws you in to focus on the mass, on the Eucharist, he wanted a centrifugal experience. He, he wanted an experience that sent people out into the world so that you hear the word and then you respond to it. He said, the church exists wherever the word is heard, heard, preached and heard. Yeah. Well, he wanted people to, to be obedient to the word and go out into the world. And I think that you could argue that the whole notion of realistic theater as it developed in the Renaissance owes a great deal to that, that idea. Uh, and Shakespeare himself, now there's scholars, a lot of scholars arguing that his notion of redemption and forgiveness that appears time and again in his plays owes a lot to the Protestant Reformation as this was uh, worked out in England at I'm that time. I was a theater major that focused on Shakespeare, and I never heard that. Wow. I just learned something. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So so as um, as Christians try to re-engage more with the arts and with theater and with cinema, are, are you encouraged by that? Are we bringing too much you know, uh, intellect to it, and not enough of the other senses. What, what's, what's your, uh, what's your view? Yeah, that's the problem. You, you, you put your finger on it. The uh, problem you're on is fire there, are today. <laughs> there are more Christians that that do uh, become involved in cinema. We we have a lot of a, ne a network here of Christians involved in in Hollywood. And in the arts, uh, more and more, Christians in the visual arts and things like that. So we can be grateful for that. But the, the problem is they don't have the tradition mm -hmm. that the Catholic and the Orthodox churches have. We don't have a, a tradition of the arts. And so we, we borrow from these other traditions, but we don't have that kind of uh, visual imagination that, that, that uh, sometimes we need to have. So that's that's a weakness of our tradition. Yeah, and, 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 and earlier, we focus on what we believe. So right, and what do you do when, you know, because if 
even sometimes when when evangelicals try to be more uh, visually oriented, less about specific propositions or specific beliefs, sometimes they get then pushed back from pastors and church friends who say, oh, you know, you're wasting your time. You haven't you haven't clearly presented the gospel. You're right. you, you're you're sucking up resources. We're not going to support you. Um, what how how can you? Convince you know I had pastors say that they couldn't support our second Veggie Tales movie because it didn't have a, a literal representation of God in it. It had a metaphorical representation of God in it or an allegorical representation. What do you say to that kind of critique? Well, I mean, it, I'm I've been a missionary, so I, I look at that this as a missional calling. How can we how can we connect with a world that is on social media, uh, is watching uh, movies. How do we connect with them? How do we find a ways to present the truth of the gospel in ways that they'll they'll hear? And that that often doesn't mean giving them the literal message. We got to find a way to attract them with with the truth of God's whole purposes for creation and for the world. And um, that's. That that's a much more holistic way of understanding. You know, we have we have friends that are that are uh, showrunners and they write for TV. Well, every Monday they have to go into work and they have to figure out how am I going to write something that <clears throat> promotes values that I believe in. Well, they're not they're not going to be able to present the gospel every week in their TV show. Right. But what they can do is work like salt and light, you know, be, be leaven in that place and, and change the values. And, and that's, that's the kind of thing we would like to encourage. Right. Okay. All right. Let's get to your book. Okay. Can we get to the new book? <laughs> Yay. I'm excited about that. Uh, the new book uh, from, uh, you're, you're a doctor, right? Doctor, can I call you Dr. Bill? No. Do people call you Dr. Bill? No. Some people call me Dr. Phil. No, they don't. I, it's, it's happened. I have an honorary doctorate, actually, from Biola. Are you serious? Yeah, they gave me one. Of, <laughs> yeah, you know. so when they presented it to you, they called you yeah, Dr. Yeah, and Phil. everyone made that funny joke, yeah. and we all chuckled, 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 and it was great. Um, okay, the new book is called Insider Jesus, Theological Reflections on New Christian Movements. I have to admit, I read that title, and afterwards I had no idea what the book was about. <laughs> like, what new Christian movements? What is this, like, insider trading? Um, <laughs> but this is how... <laughs> okay, here, here's how it starts. Hardly anything has proven more contentious in recent years than the proliferation of new forms of church and mission within non-Christian religions and religious cultures. Um, so-called emergent or insider ecclesial forms. Seen from another angle, though, hardly anything is more interesting and promising than to imagine that God might be doing a new thing in these contexts. For example, movements among people in Islam who call themselves Muslim believers in Jesus, using another, uh, the Arabic name for Jesus. Uh, that have appeared in Bangladesh and many places in Southeast Asia. There are also Hindu and Sikh followers of Jesus, um, called something else that I can't pronounce. Small groups in North <laughs> India who seek to seek to stay in their Sikh or Hindu. Are you seeking to remain Sikh um, in their Hindu communities? Movements of this kind have been called insider movements. So okay, let's let's start with that. Can I start? Yeah. Do you have any? Yeah, <laughs> well, I, yes, I have a bunch of questions. But when I first read this, um, it it jogged my memory, and I realized that a year ago I started hearing a few stories about people in remote villages, be they you know in India, just coming to faith in Christ through a dream or um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. some sort of you know waking thought, and. Um, but and and I heard people speak about that in a wonderful, exciting, can you believe it way. I was shocked as I was, you know, um, studying what you wrote about to learn that there was controversy surrounding that. So one, I wanted to ask you, can you give us some specific examples of how these um, pockets of Christianity have um, have happened, and then explain a little bit about the controversy surrounding that or why that would be negative. Well, the controversy relates to the fact that many of these people still consider themselves, for example, Hindu. 
they call themselves Hindu followers of Jesus or Hindu Christians. Well, that strikes a lot of people. Uh, one that I was interviewed last week that said, that's how, how can you mix Hinduism and Christianity? Yeah. Uh, we either are Hindu or a Christian. It's that simple, you know. Well, the fact of the matter is, um, for, for many, for centuries, the Christian church in India has been perceived as a foreign entity. It's never really, it never really was integrated into that culture. But now these people are saying, I, we can be Hindu, we can follow the Hindu practices, which to them are not religious commit, commitments so much as they are cultural and social. Uh, and, and these things are things that they think are not incompatible with their faith in Christ. So, so is, they, is the similar like thought would be um, a, a nationally or a, uh, what's the word, a, a Jewish person by culture, but not faith and religion? Same, is that well, the same yeah. idea? That's a good thing that you, that's good you mentioned that, because I, in, in the book, uh, as you know, I used the, the early Christian church, Judaism, was in a sense, uh, the Christian church was the first insider movement because Christianity emerged within Judaism. Right, right, right. Although people and, people would say, of course, Judy, Judaism and Christianity are more compatible than Christianity and Islam, right? Or that's Christ- right, that's right, that, that's very true. So and, that's and, okay, so that's okay. But yeah, but these but people, okay. they're going too far. Others are not, yeah. But, but let's take an example of Hinduism. They have they have a several uh, different sort of rituals that they go through at various times in their life. Now these are at some level have been connected with with Hindu religion, but for most people they don't think of that those as religious things. They think of them as social parts of their their social and cultural identity. Well, these Christian believers realize that these these practices can be understood purely in cultural ways. In fact, they are actually taken over and used and called by what we call Christian baptism. So rather than being a ritual to change from one uh, one period in your life to another, Christians take over those ceremonies and use them as a form of a, a form of Christian baptism, where they are coming under the, 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 the this new guru, which is Jesus, and coming under his lordship and following him. Now, I argue that that's exactly what was happening in the early church. You remember in Corinthians, Paul had to say, now, these, this meat was offered to idols. Now, this was a problem in the early church because this, at one level, it had been connected with, 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 with religion, pagan religion. But Christians said, those gods don't exist. So right, that right. meat offered to idols can be just as good as meat was not. So they could use that because they didn't believe right. that those gods actually existed. Okay, so let's let's back up and and define our terms. Okay? So so an, an insider movement, tell me if I've got this right, is basically um, the appearance of Christian belief or followers of Jesus inside another religious tradition or group that doesn't immediately pull themselves out of that group and distance themselves. Exactly. Correct? Okay. As opposed to converts who say, now I am no longer this, and I am fully this. Um, and is this something new? I mean, you, I mean you, you talk about, you know, obviously Christianity coming out of Judaism in, in a similar way, but is this something that we've always seen but just haven't talked about, or is it something that we're, we're seeing more now than, than before? Well, you know, I think it probably is something that has been present, but it's obviously something that's, in the nature of the case, unreported. I mean, how, yeah. how would you find out about these things? These yeah. are, and these for, for, in some cases, these people can't publicize what they're doing for the obvious reason that they would be in trouble. Yeah. And it's, if these people are caught in the middle because they get in trouble by admitting they're a follower of Jesus by their own imams, but on the other hand, they get in trouble by Christians. They well, come on out. So they're yeah. they're caught really in a very difficult position. Right. So we and, we want to out but, them, but if we out them, they're <laughs> <laughs> well. That's true. And there are people, and and some of the sources that I use in my book 
are pseudonyms, several several of them, yeah. because I can't I can't publicly uh, to name these people because there there would be, and in one case, one of these missionaries, and I won't name the mission, was kicked out of his mission because he opted to work with these groups, wow. and rather than encouraging them to leave Islam in yeah. this case and join the Christian Church, he said no, I think they should stay in, and this is what. They're not going to call themselves Christian, and, and we can talk about reasons for that if you want, because they have their own social and, and political reasons for not wanting to identify with Christianity. So he says, I'm going to work with them. And his mission uh, dismissed it. Said no, <laughs> said, no, you're not. So can you tell us a story um, you know, that would help us understand how this happens? Do you have an example? Okay. L- 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 let me... Um, I could, I could use that, that example, which is in the southern Philippines, in an area called Bangsamora. This has now become a new independent autonomous region in the southern Philippines. Now there's the third generation of believers in Jesus. And they are, uh, I just heard, this is sort of hot off the press, even since my book uh, came out. I was in Manila uh, three months ago and um, talking to this this my source who had just come up from southern philippines they are translating the book of acts into their own native language themselves themselves they have become so convinced that what's happening to them is exactly what was happening to the jewish believers in the book of acts hmm. and one day the imam dropped by the house and he, they had these papers out and they were they were a little bit worried that the, because the imam they still go to the mosque they they do the they they go to the prayers and they they still go to the mosque so they're nervous and and the imam said what is it that you're doing here so they explained that we're 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 translating portions of um, this is they, they call it the the scriptures Christian scriptures al Qatab and this is from a book of Acts and we're translating it into our language. And the imam was amazed. He said, that is so interesting. These are Jewish followers of Jesus. Can I use this in my teaching in the mosque? (laughs) And he said, yeah, yeah, of course you can do that. (laughs) So these people, why why would they want to leave the mosque when they are part of that community and leaving and joining the Christian church in their mind is identifying themselves with the Manila government, which is Christian government, Catholic Christian government, which has been oppressing them and their people for 300 years. Yeah, yeah. And they've moved down, they've taken over their land. These Christians have moved in from other parts in the Philippines, and that's where the churches are growing there, and these parts come moving down. And this has caused a great deal of concern among, that's why Bangsamora has become an autonomous region and has been wanting to have its own independence. Right. Well, why would they become Christian? So you can understand that. Right. It's a, it's a little bit like, you know, Gandhi's quote, I love your Christ. It's just your, your Christians I'm not so wild about. Yeah. You know, what you pointed out is exactly what I think I came to it in, in writing this book, is that we need to make the distinction between following Jesus and what that means and how people will do that. Yeah. And joining with some traditional christian church and and so how that, does how does that because the, the the big focus of your book is is you know what does this do to missions how does this affect missions what do we need to be doing differently and is is there an easy way to you know summarize did you did you i didn't get to the end of the book so i don't know if you have one conclusion or 45 conclusions um but you know if you're a missions organization or if you're someone you know even if you're thinking about short-term missions or or vocational ministry in an area that's not open to missions how does it change your approach well, I think it, it, I don't think this is a major change, but what this does is reminds us that missions is something that God is doing in the hearts and minds of people. Uh, Christian, you mentioned earlier about the dreams that people have. This is a major reason for a lot of these Muslims becoming followers of Jesus. I've heard that. Yeah, they have, they have a dream in which they, Jesus appears to them and they become convinced that that's, that's who they should follow. 
Now, they still honor Muhammad. So what this means for missions is that we should be much more sensitive to what God is actually doing so that we're, we're less concerned about our own kind of strategies. And we're so good at that. You know, we have all our strategies and all of our, you do this first and do that second. And rather than, you know, spending a lot of time listening to people and finding out what is God God really doing right. there. And, and how can I, how can I go in like my, these friends I'm telling you about in the Philippines, they've determined they're going to be with these people. They're just going to stick with these people and encourage them, help them, uh, help them get uh, access to some of the better things that they should be reading and things and with their training. And, uh, but mainly they're there just to show their own love and solidity, uh, solidarity with them. Yeah. Okay. I've got a, a, a quote from your book that uh, I thought was very interesting. Um, All the groups we consider, what we call insider and emergent movements, must be seen and evaluated, not initially in the light of the Christian church, but in terms of this larger redemptive rule of God in the world. Can you unpack that a little? What's the difference between the Christian church and the redemptive rule of God in the world? Aren't they one and the same? Right. Well, what... The, what that amounts to and what actually we're working and my colleague and I are working on in a follow-up book on, on now what does this mean for the church is to remind ourselves that what Christ came to do and I make this point in this book what Christ came to do was not to found the Christian church but to bring about the kingdom of God he came to found the kingdom the the, the central focus of his preaching was the kingdom of God that is the rule of God in life and, and in the world. And that, that involves his death and resurrection, which is the whole, what Paul calls the whole new creation, the whole renewing of the created order, which eventually will include everything that is, and God is in the busy of business of doing that, bringing about that renewal, that, that, that salva- salvation that the New Testament talks about. So, but that's, the church is a vehicle of that. Mm-hmm. But it's not the goal of what God came to do in Jesus Christ. Uh, in fact, David uh, Bosch, the famous missiologist in 1990, said that, that 95, he said that uh, Christ did not come to found the church. He came to bring about the kingdom. And that's caused a lot of uh, problems for a lot of missionaries and things because they think their work is just planning the church, which of course it is. I mean, that's a major part of what we do. Yeah. But we have to keep in mind that that's the planning of the church is to the end of of extending God's reign, extending the right. rule of God that came in and, Jesus. And that may be happening in certain cultures without any involvement of what we would think of as the traditional church, global church. Exactly. Conversations exactly. like... Although, in, in fairness to missions... Most of these people had some encounter with missionaries at some point. Okay. So this is, in a sense, a fruit of mission. Yeah. So we should be grateful for that. And it's not as though missionaries are no, no longer needed or anything like that. I'm not saying that. All we, we, all we need is the right app, and it should take care of itself, <laughs> right? <laughs> Conversation, yeah, conversations like this bust into my ethnocentricity, you uh-huh. know, because I, I am then convicted about an, an underlying operating system I wasn't really even aware of. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I remember when I was growing up, I was in a Baptist church, and there were so, there was so much about missions when I was mm-hmm. little. And mm-hmm. I, I can remember thinking that the only, you know, hearing of a missionary call us to serve in Africa, and I thought the only way the African people will ever come to know Jesus is if I go, or if we all go, let's go to Africa. And we in America, I think, feel the burden of the rest of the world. You know, it's up to us to Mm -hmm. take the gospel of Christ throughout everywhere, including that 1040 window, and if we don't, you know, Christ is never going to return. Is, all is lost. All is lost. And, all is lost. and truthfully, yeah. you know, stories of like this just really demonstrate that that's just a fool's errand. It's so silly. But it's, it's not up to us. Yeah, but you're not off the hook. Well, that's true, too. You're still supposed to, although not make converts, make disciples, right? Right. And you, and you do draw some distinction that needs to be drawn between kind of the classic model of I need to go get people to believe these things 
you know, which is more about converts. Um, but but disciples is a, is a slightly different thing. How do you how do you nuance that? What's what's you're much more up to date on you know where missions is headed and and what the I didn't realize there was such a big academic side of missions. You know, I thought it was more. What kind of pith helmet do you wear in the jungle? <laughs> but there's there's a whole like you know tens of of years of hundreds of years of books and thinking and thinkers. Um, what are we trying to do when we send out missionaries? What's really the goal now? Well, the goal is to find out what's what's happening in these places. And as I say, a lot of those things are not visible in books. By the way, you know, it, it, these are. These are movements that are really under the radar. And, but, and, and what that means to become a disciple is going to look really, really different in all these places. And we should be prepared for this difference. And we should be willing to acknowledge it and learn from it. I uh, haven't talked about Buddhists, but there's a movement in Eastern Thailand called New Buddhists. And there's thousands, apparently thousands of these people who call themselves New Buddhists, but they're really followers of Jesus. But, but they still read the, the, the Buddhist texts. They still consider that they honor Buddha in the same way that Islam, Muslim followers of Jesus honor Muhammad, but not as a savior. Hmm. He's, he, he's, he's a leader and a prophet. The problem with Buddha, these new Buddhists say, is that Buddha's teaching had a lot of wisdom to it. Well, it does. I mean, look at the way people use yoga and everything now. They're all into this, you know. There's wisdom there. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we cannot follow Buddha and his teaching on our own. We need the grace of God. We need well, that's Jesus. interesting. Yeah. And Jesus is the one that can help us be a new Buddhist, to be what, we, what we're called to do. Because Jesus is the unique Savior. I'm, glad, the, I'm glad you didn't say new Buddhist. This is the that we'll, we'll die on. Well, so, so this is really an interesting conundrum because on the one hand, as Christian, evangelical Christians, we say, in order for someone to have salvation, they need to proclaim the lordship of Jesus. And here you have these Buddhists who say, we can't do anything outside of the help of, the Jesus. of Jesus. Yeah, there's the, right. we're, we have right. to have him, and he has to be our Lord in order for us to, to, to be able be to do good Buddhists. <laughs> That's so confusing. What do you do with that? Now I see where the controversy comes yeah, in. Yeah, I can see where you yeah. come, come together for Missions Fest and people get a little confused. Yeah. yeah. Well, so are you saying that we should embrace that? We should we should accept them as followers of Jesus who are walking, who we will see with us in eternity? Or, or do we love them and continue to try to Wend them away from being new Buddhists to being <laughs> Bring reformed. Bring them along further, huh? Right. Well, I mean, you're, you've raised the fundamental question, which I, I talk about in the conclusion. And the big question is whether these kinds of movements are transitional. Uh, right. In the sense that for a while they'll be followers of, of both of this, and then they'll come to see that they need to just be a follower completely of Scripture. And, and so... And I know there's a lot of missionaries that, in fact, probably the, the dominant attitude in missions is, what, yeah, these things happen, but they are, they are transitional. Uh, I, I, I have problems with that on the one hand, because uh, for some of these people, they absolutely refuse to call themselves Christians for political and social reasons that well, I am very sympathetic to. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for all the things that Christianity has done wrong, I mean, I'm not going to die on the hill of defending all that, you know. So I, I'm sympathetic with that. So right. I, I'm, it, it may be transitional and it may be not. But then the, also the point I make in the conclusion, and this is what people don't like to hear, is what this makes me think of. And you referred to this, I think, earlier, Christian. You talked about your own understanding of missions. Our understanding of Christianity is so syncretistic that we have no notion of how syncretistic it is. Define <laughs> syncretistic for us. In that sense, we, we, have, we have 
Someone's faith has been inducted into our faith. If we have Christmas on, on December 25 and, and all the rest of it. Okay. Uh, so, so all of our specific and, cultural and entrapments and, and of our faith. Exactly. Exactly. We have German elements that came in the medieval period of Pieta and all the things of suffering of Jesus. And these things we take, we've we've adopted as part of our tradition. And, and I think for, the, for all... Uh, they're mostly good things. They're yeah. not. They're not things that have distracted us, but they've they provided windows for us by which we understand right scripture. Okay. Okay, Doctor Bill. Okay. So once upon a time, when you were a missionary, you believed you needed to teach the native about Jesus, and then you also needed to get the native to wear Western clothes and sing Western hymns <laughs> and read English. You know, and then eventually we said, no, 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 wait a minute. They don't have to become Westerners. So okay. Right, right, so you right. can keep wearing your clothes, you know, and right. you can and and what you could even write your own hymns, you know, but you'll come out and you'll build a little building that we'll call a church and it will have pews in it. And you'll sit in the church and not do, you know, the other traditions. You'll come out of some of the traditions. And, it, you know, it sounds like, well, there's another layer to this of, of oh, wait a minute, which, which of those things are we also carrying from our own culture and throwing onto their cultures? I guess my question is, when do you know to stop? stripping things away you know when when have you cut too far and you know like trimming your dog's nails oops we've cut too far and and there's nothing left um how do you know and, and is that really what all this debate is about is when have that you stripped it down too far the fact is a matter i don't know the answer to that question but i think that we have to be sensitive to the fact that God is busy uh, with these people. God is at work and the spirit is drawing these people through dreams and various ways. And so what I'm thinking and what we're working on in our, our current book, which we actually getting just got another uh, yesterday, we heard our contract from universities coming for this book. It's Yay. called Discovering Church. Okay, with the big fat check. And so what we're doing with that is, right Darren Dirksen at Fresno Pacific uh, University and I are writing it, we're asking, okay, now what if we think about the church in different ways? What do we think about the church as sets of practices that are an emerging phenomenon rather than thinking about it in terms of social structure or historical institutions? What if we think about it in different ways? And basically, the emergent church, as you know, I'm sure you've maybe had people on your podcast of the emergent church. Yeah. They're, they're, ask, they're probing in the in very same ways. They're saying, hey, wait a minute, let's rethink well, what, what it means to be the church. And what if it means witnessing to Jesus with our lives? What if it means getting together and studying scripture together? What if it means having fellowship and table fellowship together in the name of Jesus? What if those, <clears throat> those become sort of central practices that that define uh, groups that wouldn't look like churches but maybe they are forms of church yeah yeah very very interesting so so i would be very curious to know is there a place where i can go and read stories about you know these insider incidences. I'm very curious as to how they. The book is called Insider Jesus: Theological Reflections on New Christian Movements. There no. are case studies in the book. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> but but certainly there there are more. Uh, is their top secret, or they get, they get killed. Well, <laughs> to be people... honest with you, there are there there are not many places you can go. There's a book. There's a book called uh, Insider Movements. Is by John J. Travis uh, that came out. I, I cited several times in my book. Uh, it's about a 700-page book. Uh, Ooh, William I, I think Perry I'll read yours. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, that's a book that collect, collects pretty much most of what's been written about insider movements with a lot of illustrations of it. So, so there are, but to be honest with you, most of, most of these are stories that have not been recorded for various reasons. Yeah, I heard about a group in India of, of maybe as many as half a million people. And I asked, and my colleague had come back from India and was telling me about this. I said, I said, where do you read about it? Is there's nothing, it's all oral. 
there's there's no there's no study of it it's, it's all this is this is things that are going on right now so th these are things that we have to just stay tuned and keep watching and but you can meanwhile you can pray for meanwhile them. And, and i can read yeah. your book yeah, yeah, that, that was actually my, my last question. Uh, average Joe in the pew in Peoria, okay? What difference does this make? How, what, what, what would they do differently in their life after reading your book? Well, I hope they think about people who decide to follow Jesus and they don't have to all look alike and they maybe uh. are doing, doing things that may surprise us, but I think we'll, we'll be able to learn from them. I mean, after reading about all how these people began to follow Jesus in their own way, I had to say, well, I learned something about, I learned right. something about how I might become obedient to Jesus in a new way. And, th and, that, so. and that, is part of, that is part of the point of the book, I think, right? That looking at missions as, you know, I go out to them so that they can learn from me. I have nothing to learn from them. Right. Setting that aside and saying, "Wait a minute!" And this was, there was a quote in your book that I that I just loved is that God doesn't arrive in missionary suitcases. He's already been there. <laughs> you know? he's been, God is at work. Yeah, he's at work. He's been there for for the beginning, and right. and going with the open mind to to ask the question, "How is God already working here before I even got here?" Right. That's a really interesting view of missions. It is, and as I am, you know, I am an average Joe sitting in the pew in close Peoria. to Peoria, and, uh, you know, I, I've been very encouraged about hearing these stories, because he, hearing the examples of God just sparking something somewhere out of nothing, yeah. and, and creating this fire that is, you know, powerful right. and spreading, if he can do that in India, he can do that with me. Amen. You know? he can do it in my workplace. He can do it in my community. Yeah. All right. Okay. Kind of I gotta wrap it up with a song. <clears throat> Let's see how this goes. And apologies in advance for anything uh, cross culturally insensitive. <laughs> that, that oh no. We just spent some time with Bill Durness. <laughs> I hope he's keeping warm. I hope his house has a furnace. <laughs> but we just learned a lot, uh, more or less, about the movements inside. What uh, God, I guess, is doing in the rest of the world. And it's with all these uh, non-white, non-American boys and girls. Because there really seems to be a new movement, and we can prove it when we uh, let them teach us to and read his book, Insider Jesus. Okay, short and sweet. <laughs> Uh, Bill, thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, the book is Insider Jesus, Theological Reflections on New Christian Movements. You can get it wherever. It's from IVP Academic, so it's more of an academic book. Mm. Are there pictures? Any pictures? No pictures. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> we'll okay. have to use our well, imaginations. You, is there any chance we could do a graphic novel version of your book? <laughs> no? He's laughing at you, Phil. Okay, that's good. That means Everybody it's, can do that, but not me. <laughs> it's time to wrap it up. If you want to support the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash Phil Fisher, and you can keep us on the air. Uh, thanks to our guest, Bill. Sky will be back next week. Also, check out Sky's uh, podcast, The Marriage, The Wedding, The Movie Proposal. <laughs> The Goodness movie gracious. proposal with his friend Josh. Uh, they talked about silence. Josh is our last friend. Week. Yeah, he's our friend too. That's okay. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so I want to thank everybody for praying for me. Yeah, Christian has uh, a house. I now have a house, and Yay. I have now been moved in for, I think, a week or something. She's no longer homeless. That's true. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank my mother, who has been oh, yeah. feeding me and Who's helping me. sitting in our clothes. studio <laughs> audience right now. Our yeah. studio audience So thanks, one. guys, for praying for me. Okay, we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. The Phil Fisher Podcast is produced by Phil Fisher Enterprises and recorded live at Jellyfish Lab Studios. This episode was edited by Jason Rugg and was fact-checked by absolutely no one. For more information, go to philfisher.com. Phil Fisher.